So we're studying uh, Matthew's description of Jesus in his gospel where he emphasizes the royal aspect of Jesus' character. Uh, all of our lessons therefore have followed this theme of Jesus as the king bringing his heavenly kingdom to those who would receive it here on, on earth. So far Jesus has demonstrated this royal position and I'm going to you know, review a little bit of the things that we've talked about uh, as far as the theme is concerned. Uh, Jesus has demonstrated his royal position uh, by the worship he received uh, as a baby, uh, by the witness he has received from the Father and the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist. He has demonstrated his exalted position by uh, defeating evil spirits, uh, beginning with Satan himself in the desert. He has shown himself to be Lord over disease and handicaps, even death itself. Uh, in his uh, ministry and miracles. And then more recently we've seen his power over the material world uh, by the multiplication of the fish and the bread and the calming of the storm with just, his, uh, with just his word. Now in our last several lessons we saw him enter the city of Jerusalem uh, as its king, doing so as the prophet said he would on the back of a colt or a foal of a donkey. Uh, and we saw the joy of the people, uh, mainly the poor and the children, the handicapped, uh, the ill, the outcast. They, they were happy uh, for His uh, presence. We also saw, however, that the leaders in Jerusalem, the Sadducees, uh, the, the, the priests of the Pharisees, the elders uh, uh, of the people, uh, they didn't welcome Him with open harm, uh, arms, rather they challenged his authority and his ministry. And it was interesting to see how the Lord responded to every one of their, of their challenges. The end result, of course, was that each group was silenced and on some occasion uh, even um, ridiculed, uh, but none of them came to faith. That's, that's the whole idea. None of them actually believed, even when their questions and their doubts were uh, answered. And I, I kind of fast forward into, the, into our times today. How many people do we know are, are like this? You, know, you answer all of their questions, you give a good Christian witness with your life, but still they refuse to believe and obey the Lord. And usually it's because they, they enjoy disbelieving better than they do uh, believing. Uh, normally it's to continue in sin, continue uh, in their disbelief, which permits them to kind of live their lives uh, as they wish, because the moment you believe, then you, you, know, you have to have a life uh, according, to, uh, to according to Christ. Anyways, once the Lord has finished dealing with the leaders who have rejected Him as the Messiah, He pronounces several woes or judgments upon them because of their disbelief and their hypocrisy. After these, pronounce, uh, these pronouncements, Jesus and His disciples who are still in the temple area, and here's where we pick up from uh, last time, they're still in the temple area after He's pronounced the woes against uh, the city and its leaders. Uh, there's a discussion that begins uh, about the end, of the, uh, the end of the world. And this takes place as one of the apostles makes a comment about the temple building itself and Jesus uses this occasion to describe several scenes of judgment um, that will be taking place. That's why this lesson is entitled The King's Judgment. Okay, so open your Bibles, as I say, to Matthew 24. We're going to begin to describe the judgments that Jesus describes in these often misunderstood uh, chapters. A lot of material to cover uh, today. So we begin in Matthew 24. Beginning in verse one, it says, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when His disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to Him. And He said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As He was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the uh, end of the age? So uh, imagine the scene, Jesus is leaving the temple area and as He leaves, this is after everything that has gone on, right? The, the debate with the leaders, uh, Him pronouncing the woes or the judgments on the city and the leaders and so on and so forth. As He leaves, 
they point out the magnificent buildings of the temple area, which he has just said will one day be deserted. Now during that period, the temple had undergone 50 years of reconstruction work and the latest effort had been paid for by Herod himself. So in verse one and two, Jesus responds to their comments by saying that the buildings will not only be empty, but they'll be torn down. This sets up further questions by the apostles, you know, Peter and James and John and Andrew in Matthew 13, three, who wanted more information about what he just said. And so they question him about two things. First, um, when will this destruction of the temple be? You, know, you said that all these things would be torn down. When is that going to happen? And then a second question, uh, what signs will accompany the end of the world which will be brought on by the second coming? Now you have to remember um, whether the, apostle th uh, the apostles thought that these two events would happen at the same time or not, we don't know. You know perhaps the, you know, it seems that they were asking two questions, but they were thinking, well, this is all going to happen at the same time, because they couldn't imagine a world without the temple. So they want to know, well, when's the temple going to be destroyed, these buildings to be destroyed, and when's the end of the world going to be? What are the signs? They may have assumed that these two events were going to happen at the same time. Nevertheless, they're, they're asking two, uh, two different uh, questions. Uh, we do know from their question, however, that they were asking about two different events, two very separate events, the destruction of the temple and then the return of the Lord. So the following section in Matthew can become confusing um, if we're not careful. So it helps if we divide it into three views of history that Jesus spoke about in answering His apostles these two questions. Okay, so let's go over the three views uh, that are contained. The first view is the panoramic view, uh, verses 4 to 14. We'll read those later. In these verses, Jesus describes an overview or a panoramic view of world history that includes the time before the destruction of the temple, the time after the destruction of the temple and the period at the end of time when He will return. Okay, so the first 14 verses talks about a, a, a panoramic view. Okay, second view uh, is um, the telescopic view into the destruction of Jerusalem and what takes place at that time, verses 15 to 35. So in these verses, Jesus telescopes or focuses in on one great event in the history of man and the history of the Jews in particular, and that's the destruction of Jerusalem, which we know took place in 70 AD. So Jesus spoke when He was 33 years old, so this event was to take place more than three decades in the future. So you have the panoramic view, you then have you know, Jesus focusing in on a particular event, the destruction of Jerusalem, and then there's the third view, and that's a telescopic view to the second coming and the end of the world, verses 36 to 44. So he finishes with a look to the very far future when he will return, ushering in the end of days and the judgment. So if we keep these three views in mind, it'll help us untangle these complex verses, okay? So let's go back now and take a look at the panoramic view in verses four to 14, and we begin with verse four. It says, and Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. So right away, you know, he warns them that there can be confusion uh, and mis uh, misleading confusion about what he is going to say. So the instructions given so that they will know and avoid false teachers and prophets in these matters, okay? So let's read verses five to eight. It says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. 
And so the cycle of false prophets and wars and troubles in the world, Jesus says these things will continue until the end, but these in themselves are not the signs. They are only the beginning of things which will get progressively worse before not only the end of Jerusalem happens, but also the end of the world takes place. So let's read verses 9 to 12. He says, Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. So this passage here is a parallel to the passages in 2 Thessalonians where Paul talks about the end of the world and what must take place first. Paul says that the first thing that has to take place is apostasy, you know, a falling away uh, of the believers. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the love of God you know, grows cold, if you wish. Then Paul in 1st Thessalon and 2nd Thessalonians says that the man of lawlessness who deceives many through false signs tries to take the place of God, but he will be, uh, he will be revealed. Um, and then uh, in this passage here, Jesus is describing the, what I call the devolution. You know, we talk about evolution, you know, things getting better. Well, in this passage, uh, Jesus is talking about the devolution of the world. In other words, things getting progressively worse in a cycle. And let me just show you a little uh, image here to describe the, the devolution, if you wish, that Jesus is talking about. This cycle that continues on until the end of time. So it begins with a theological fall. Okay? And what I, say, what I mean by theological fall is that People stop believing in God. You know, their love for God grows cold. They, they reject God, so that they fall away from God, if you wish. The next fall, the next stage in this devolution process is what I call a philosophical fall. In other words, when you, when you grow away from God, when you reject God, then human beings begin to invent ideas that explains life and that explains death. And all of these ideas that are, or philosophies, that, if you wish, that exclude God in their explanation of life uh, are bound for failure, are a symbol, if you wish, of the fall of man. So there's a theological fall, then there's a philosophical fall, and then what usually follows a philosophical fall, you know, man-made ideas, is a moral fall. In other words, morality, uh, immorality rather, increases. And if this cycle were to continue to go downward, it would mean the end of the world. But in history, there's another you know, point in this devolution cycle, and that's revival. In other words, God does something to revive, to, you know, like the paddles, you know, to revive a, a heart attack victim. You know. God provides some sort of revival, if you wish, to revive the spirit of man. And we see it throughout history, you know, the Protestant Reformation, that was a, that was a revival of sorts. You know, all those back to the Bible revivals, a great awakening. You know. So the idea, is this, uh, the, uh, the idea is that throughout history there's this, you know, this, this cycle of devolution that takes place. Theological fall, philosophical fall, moral fall, and then, uh, oh, a revival if you wish, back to God, back to belief. And this keeps going until as, as we'll see in these passages, until we get to the point where you know, we have a theological and philosophical and moral fall and it gets so bad, okay, the man of lawlessness is revealed and the end of the world takes place uh, as, Jesus, uh, as Jesus appears. So this is a kind of a, you know, just a, a little image, if you wish, to help us understand what Jesus is explaining to his apostles here the panoramic view of how things are going to happen throughout history. You know, this cycle, this, this devolution cycle that keeps going round and round uh, throughout uh, history. So let's read uh, verse uh, 13. He says, but the one who endures to the end, uh, he will be saved. In contrast, he promises that the faithful will be saved despite these trials, despite this you know, cycle of a devolution. And then in verse 14 he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So he also promises that the Great Commission will be carried out 
and must be carried out before the end, that's the end of the world, will come. So this is the panoramic view of the events and the flow of history that will occur until His second coming. All right. So now we move on to the uh, telescopic view and that is to the fall of Jerusalem. All right, so we've had this panoramic view, the cycle you know, that will keep on going till the end of time, till Jesus returns. Now Jesus focuses in on a particular event in that panoramic view and that is the fall of Jerusalem. You need to understand that Judea, that area, was a rebellious, uh, was a rebellious territory, if you wish, in the Roman Empire. The people there longed to return to the glory days of independence and power at the time of Solomon. And so in the early 60s, I don't mean the 1960s, I mean the 60s, uh, they had such unrest that Rome sent troops to quell the rebellion. And so from 66 to 70 AD, the Roman army successfully laid siege to Jerusalem and totally destroyed the city and the temple along with over a million people that were killed. This total destruction of the Jewish nation was the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy to the disciples you know, some 30 years earlier described in this particular passage. And so the, uh, the disciples wanted to know when this would happen. You know, Jesus said these buildings would be knocked down, so they wanted to know when is this going to happen, and Jesus gives them the signs to watch out for because many of them would still be alive when this thing uh, was happening. So let's read uh, verses uh, 15 to 18. It says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. And so the first sign was the abomination of desolation the first sign of the impending destruction of Jerusalem is what Jesus calls the abomination of desolation. Now the point was that when the temple would be desecrated, this is the abomination here, when the temple would be desecrated, this would be a sign that destruction was near and His disciples should flee the city at that time. Now in Daniel chapters 11 and 12, Daniel had prophesied that the temple would be defiled, and it was in the days of the Maccabees. Uh, this is uh, you know, 100 years or so before Christ. In the days of the Maccabees, and the temple was desecrated by the uh, Syrian king Epiphanes, who sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple, among other things. He did many other things to desecrate the worship. Actually, he wanted to outlaw the worship of the Jews. And so, what, so all Jews, especially the apostles, they were familiar with this historical event, you know, the, the, the desecration of the temple during the time of the uh, Maccabean revolt, if you wish. The Maccabeans, uh, they were the Jews who were rev revolting against uh, uh, the, this, this king. All right? So the Jews were familiar with the idea that the temple had once been desecrated in a particular way. So what Jesus does is He picks up this idea and says that in the same way, when the temple will be defiled again by Gentiles during their lifetimes, it'll be the signal to escape. Okay? You, see the, you see the idea here? He picks up a historical idea that all of them were familiar with that had happened in the not too distant past, and he says when that happens again, that'll be a sign that you know, the temple, the city, is going to be destroyed and you need to, you need to get out. Now, in Luke chapter uh, 21, verse 20, interesting, uh, Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. So this is a parallel passage here to Matthew. So Luke tells us that the surrounding of the temple by foreign armies, this is what is going to defile the temple. Um, so how does that happen? How does that the surrounding of the temple or the city by foreign Gentile armies, how does that defile the temple? 
Well, the standards or the shields okay, that were carried by the Roman army were themselves idolatrous and they were often used for worship by the soldiers uh, and, and so Jesus is saying when these idolatrous shields, you know, standards if you wish, when they surround the city, then this, the effect of that is that it desecrates the temple. You have idols that are surrounding the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now many scholars, you know, they differ here as to what the abomination is and many of them refer to Jewish historians for events that occurred before or after the siege that would fit. But here's the thing, Luke chapter 21 verse 20 is the only biblical reference that actually fits the context. Jesus Himself says, when you see the city surrounded by foreign armies, recognize that her desolation is near. And then in Matthew 24 He says, you know, when you see the abomination of desolation, you know, get out. So you know, it's always best to allow the scriptures to interpret uh, themselves. Then he says, he who reads, this means he who reads Daniel and along with Christ's uh, what's called a cryptogram uh, or a clue if you wish, will be able to know when it's time to get out. And as a matter of fact, historically we know that many Christians understood what was going on here because in 68 AD, a couple of years into the siege, but a couple of years before the, the very end, the majority of Christians that were living in Jerusalem escaped to Pella, a nearby town, thus avoiding being killed in the massacre. So they got it, they understood what was going on. When, surrounding, when the armies, you know, pagan armies are surrounding the city, you know that the end is near and so they got out. So let's read verses, uh, uh, go back to Matthew, read verses 19 to 21. He says, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as uh, has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So the tribulations uh, are the suffering caused by the Romans which wiped out the nation. As I said, over a million killed. And of course, you know, the combination of the gravity of the sin, you know, the Jews who received the blessings and the promises of God and yet still killed the Messiah when He came, so the, the gravity of the sin and the horror of the punishment, I mean an entire nation wiped out and its religion wiped out. Uh, the Bible says no, nothing like this has ever happened before, never will. In verse 22 it says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, meaning Christians, those days will be cut short. So God's providence permitted this war to end so that the Christians would not also be annihilated along with the Jews. Their city was destroyed and Romans, you see, they made no distinction between Christian and non-Christian Jews. For them, a Jew was a Jew, it didn't matter what his religion was, they were to be wiped out. In verse 23 we read, then if anyone says to you, behold, he is, uh, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out, or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. And so, the believers would naturally associate the destruction of Jerusalem with the return of Jesus. Remember I said at the beginning, I'm not sure if the uh, apostles thought that the end of, you know, destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world were one and the same. You know, one would happen right after the other. So Jesus here is warning them, warning believers who would naturally associate the destruction of Jerusalem with the return of Jesus so the Lord warns them against being deceived by those who would claim to be the Lord or speak from God at that critical time. Now Josephus, who was a Jewish historian of the time, he documents how during this period, the siege okay, of Jerusalem by the Roman army, during this period, rumors of the Messiah coming or being present circulated in order to keep people in the city, because the, the leaders said, you know, if we stay in the city, we'll be safe. So they were always trying to keep people in the city. 
In those days, hysteria and fear produced many prophets who claimed uh, visions and messages uh, from God. As a matter of fact, uh, one fake prophet said that he would separate the Sea of Galilee and 25,000 people followed him out and were ultimately uh, destroyed. Verse 27, now remember, we're still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem here. Jesus is still talking about that. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of man be. So he, um, he tells them that when he does return, not in 70 AD, it will be evident to everyone like lightning across the sky. Uh, all will be easily and readily seen. Everyone will know that it is He. There won't be any doubt, there won't be any speculation, there won't be any uh, confusion like there is during the siege of Jerusalem. You see what he's, he's saying? He's, you know, for those of you who think this is the second coming, you know, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, let me tell you this, during the second coming, you know, when the Son of Man comes, you know, there won't be any speculation, there won't be any false Christs, there won't be anything like that. Everybody will know very clearly that this is the return of Jesus. Okay? So he makes that point to kind of you know, uh, uh, make sure there's no confusion here. Then one more, um, one more uh, comment he makes again about the siege of Jerusalem, destruction of Jerusalem. He says, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So the corpse is the Jewish nation. The vultures are the false Christs and prophets. When you see them in abundance, this will be a second sign that the end of Jerusalem is near. Verse 29, I said one more verse, but we have a couple of more. It says, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So the first word in this verse presents a problem to some people. It says, but immediately, immediately. If we make this next section a discussion about the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus, then it has to happen immediately after the destruction of Jerusalem. You see what I'm saying? Just, it's just grammar. He's talking about this, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and then he says immediately after that. Well, if what he's saying in this and the next couple of verses you know, talk about the end of the world and his second coming, then the second coming has to have happened after the destruction of Jerusalem. And a lot of people believe that that's what he actually, uh, that's what he actually taught here. Uh, a lot of people uh, call it the 70 AD theory, if you wish. They believe Jesus has already come. Now, since the man of lawlessness has not been revealed and Jesus has not returned, uh, we know that this passage must still be talking about the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem. Next verse, 30. He says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the sky uh, to the other. So verse 29 to 31 talks about the destruction and the effects that it has on others and on believers. Uh, the language style is apocalyptic, and you understand what apocalyptic uh, language or the literary, uh, apocalyptic literary style is. We've learned that in other, in other studies. You know, it's a particular type of uh, language usually used, if you wish, uh, to describe cataclysmic and historical political events. All right. Uh, among other things, used in uh, the book of Revelation to kind of hide the message from non-believers. Isaiah 13 describes the destruction of Babylon in similar language, this, this very uh, exalted, uh, you know, kind of scary language, if you will. Um, so language using the symbolism of the destruction of the heavenly bodies is used to describe the very real fate of the world at the end but it's also used to describe the end and the destruction of nations. So we use this, or the, the writers of the Bible use this kind of apocalyptic language 
yes, to talk about the end of the world, and yes, especially in Revelation, so on and so forth, but also, also they use this type of language to describe some momentous event that took place in history, usually the destruction of a nation. Um, in this case, uh, they're using, uh, Jesus is using this language in order to describe the end of the Jewish nation as a people under God's special care. And that's a momentous thing. Here's a nation that's been uh, there for uh, centuries, uh, now coming to an end, its purpose uh, exhausted. And so the coming of the Son of Man that we read about here refers to both the second coming at the end of the world, yes, but also the final judgment on a nation, any nation that God makes, in this case, a judgment on the nation of Israel. And it also fits with the context of this passage. The Jews who rejected Him now will see Him coming as a form of judgment on their nation, a terrible catastrophe that would horrify the world, but liberate Christians and the gospel from Jewish persecution. The whole point here about the elect and the angels and the messengers going to collect the souls, you know, the idea is that the, 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 the main, you know, whole, the main the obstacle to Christianity in the first century um, was the Jewish nation. You know, Paul was hounded by uh, Jewish uh, leaders. Uh, the restrictions on Christianity came from uh, the Jews that didn't want it to, to flourish. Take away the Jewish nation and Christianity uh, began to flourish and spread evenly, uh, spread uh, evenly, of course, uh, spread across the world. So the Greek word that is translated angel can also be translated messenger. So this verse can be seen as prophecy concerning the spreading of the gospel throughout the world after the fall of Jerusalem. You know, in verse 14 said that this needed to be done before Christ's return. And now with the ideological and the cultural restraints of Judaism removed, Christianity could flourish even more. Go, we go to 32. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branches already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that He is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So Jesus warns them to pay attention to the signs that He has given them because they will happen in their generation. Again, if He's talking about the end of the world, then the end of the world should have happened in their generation. Okay? And He promises by His word that these things are going to happen. Okay, so all the way up to verse 35, okay, he is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, giving them signs about you know, when it will happen, kind of giving clues to the believers when to escape with their lives. Also describing the idea that when the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, the temple and the nation and you know, the influence of the Jewish religion is removed, then the gospel will be released to be preached throughout the world. All right. So now we go to a second focus. Remember the panoramic view, telescope into the 70 AD destruction, and now Jesus is going to telescope in, but to the events uh, taking place at the end of the world. Okay? So He's just explained to them the signs that will preview the destruction of Jerusalem, as I said. The preaching of all nations uh, you know, will take place, Romans 10, 18. The multiplication of false Christs, we know that happened because of Josephus, writes about that. The abomination of the temple, Luke 21, uh, 20 talks about that. And then the great tribulation, the suffering that took place and the horror of the thing. Again, Josephus writes about that in his history. Now in verse 36 to 44, he makes a contrast of this event, 70 AD, with the second coming at the end of the world. So let's read that, beginning in verse 36. But of that day, that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So He's told them clues on when to figure out when the destruction is going to happen. 
But now he switches, he's talking about the end of the world and the very first thing he says about the second coming is that nobody knows, no one knows the time, not even Jesus while he is with his disciples. So of course this refers to the second coming, not to the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's keep going, it says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah, for as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until that day, or until the day, that Noah entered the ark. Um, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. So he says, there will be no cataclysmic signs for the second coming. Yeah, so when we talked about 70 AD, right, there were signs and he told them watch for this, and watch. but now he's talking about the second coming, the end of the world. He says there will be no signs, everything will seem normal. Normal in the sense that the believers will be preparing themselves for the second coming and the end of the world and the rest of the world will be ignoring all of it until it is too late, just like the time of Noah. Verse 40. Then there will be two men in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. Oh, such confusion about this verse. Some take this verse to mean that before Jesus returns, some will be taken in a, quote, rapture and they'll disappear to be with God in heaven. This is part of the premillennialist view of the rapture and the thousand year reign. A lot of books, even movies, you know, even license plates you know, say, you know, if I'm not in my car, you know, I'm up in the rapture, you know, this idea. But if you look at this verse in context, Jesus is talking about the end of the world, but He's talking about readiness. He says that when He returns suddenly, okay, one person will be saved, and one person will be lost, there will be no time for repentance and change. That's what he's saying. Just like Noah, when the rain came, they were taken and they disappeared into the ark and the others remained to die in the flood. And so Jesus is saying, when He comes, the faithful will be taken to be with Him and the disbelievers immediately put away from His presence. That's what he's talking about. Verse 42 to 44, therefore be on the alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. So since the end is like this, everything is normal and then all of a sudden, boom, it's over. We should always be prepared and not foolishly lapsed into sin, thinking that we've got plenty of time to repent and plenty of time to be ready for the return. We never know, he says. You have to always be ready. Mm, okay, so he finishes. Now he's talked about this. Okay. He's talked about the panoramic view of history, you know, the cycle, the devolution. You know. Then he's talked to, zeroed in on the 70 AD, the signs that will accompany that, you know, the clue uh, given to believers to know when to escape and so on and so forth. And then he telescopes into the end of the world and, and tells them the very opposite. But when the end of the world comes, there is no clue. Nobody knows when it comes. It'll happen suddenly. You know, two, people, two people are working equally at a task. The end comes. One is saved. One is lost, no time for repentance, no time for a change of mind. So he finishes this and he, he, he uh, uh, gives them parables all right, to explain the things that he's just told them, to reinforce the main idea that he's given them. And the main idea is to be ready. Be ready when 70 AD comes, be ready, look at the clues, you know, pay attention. And if you live beyond that, like we do today, be ready because at the end of the world there won't be any clues, you have to be ready all the time. So he gives several parables that underscores that idea of being ready. We won't read them, but I'll just kind of summarize them. The first one is the parable of the evil slave. Okay, uh, verses 45 to 51. Here the lesson is not to uh, presume that we have the luxury of sinning because the end is far away. 
It can come at any time and the judgment is sure for those who are uh, unfaithful. And so that's the parable of the evil slave. The next one is the parable of the ten virgins, right? We're familiar with that. So, you know, they're waiting for the bridegroom. Some of them run out of oil. The ones who have the oil, they go to the, with the bridegroom. The ones that don't have the oil, they're shut out. Okay. So here Jesus warns against the foolishness of not being ready. Uh, you know, there's not, it's not a question of evil here like the other, paragraph, the other parable. It's a question of negligence. To neglect Christ will bring destruction in the end as well. So that second parable explains that same idea. And then thirdly, the parable of the talents, 14 to 30. Here the warning is for those who are in the kingdom, but who fail to expand its borders and fail to serve the king with zeal. Uh, in the parable of the talents, the slave, he wasn't caught or surprised unprepared. He just assumed that his preparation was sufficient when it wasn't. So all these parables have the element of preparation and judgment and punishment for those who neglect to prepare for the return of the master. Certainly for the Jews and the Christians in 70 AD, they had to be ready, they had to be watching, and certainly for us uh, and future generations, we have to be ready and watching also, but our watching is not looking for clues. Our watching is watching ourselves to make sure that we are ready spiritually for when the Lord will come. And then in uh, chapter 25, again, not going to read all of that, but that's the climax of all of this, you know, the, the, the prophecy about 70 AD, the end of the world and all the parables. The climax is the judgment scene, right? The climax of this discor uh, the discourse uh, that we've just gone through is the judgment scene at the end of the world. You know, the sheep and the goats, that type of thing. Those who have, uh, those who have uh, 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 fed the hungry and, 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 and taken care of the poor and visited the sick and those who are in prison, so on and so Those people who have done that, you know, they, they receive the, the blessing. Those people who have neglected that, they do not <clears throat> receive the blessing. And so those found to be righteous have obeyed the commands to love God and they refer to Him as Lord as well uh, as their neighbor. The idea of the climax of this is how are you going to be ready? You know? You're going to be ready by doing the will of the Lord. And what is the will of the Lord? Well, that you love your neighbor, that you serve your neighbor, uh, that you keep yourself free from uh, the effects of the world. And those condemned, they have the very same judgment and are condemned because, well, they weren't ready. How were they not ready? They knew about the Lord and so on and so forth. Yes, but their faith did not produce any fruit. And so the punishment and the reward is eternal uh, in nature. And the overarching theme for all of this, the passages about the, the, the panoramic view, the 70 AD, the end of the world, all the parables and then the, the judgment scene, you know, the, 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 the whole overarching theme is you have to be ready. You have to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Uh, you have to be ready for the coming of the King that we say in our particular uh, series here. Okay, so that's a long lesson, a lot of material there. I uh, hope that that has uh, kind of um, uh, clarified a, a really complicated a passage of scripture um, uh, for those who are studying and taking this uh, course. All right, one more lesson to go, uh, lesson number 12, uh, and we'll take that up next week. Thank you very much for your attention.